This is Steve with the uh, Commander software. Trisha, are you in on the call? All right, this is Steve with the Commander software. The software uh, we're looking at today is a Windows-based product developed by MIC Systems. And we're doing, we're doing a demo today for a couple of golf cart dealers that have expressed an interest in Commander. My name is Steve and I'm the VP of Sales here at MIC. And that dispenses with the introductions for uh, purposes of the recording. Today is November 29th, 2017. So we are a software developer based in Southern California. We've been in business for uh, the past 38 years. Uh, we have offices right between Los Angeles and San Diego. So our offices are right next to the John Wayne Airport if you've ever flown out to Southern California. All of our programming, our tech support, uh, sales office, everything is here. Um, and as I said, this is a Windows-based product, so we don't cloud host it, although some folks have elected to put it on their cloud server, and that is an option if you choose to do that. Um, it does add a little bit to the monthly cost. Now, price files are probably one of the highlights of the software. And of course, depending on the industry that you're in, um, these price books are going to be something that are going to be important to you. And this means it saves you from having to manually load the parts and prices into the system. So we'll be sending you a price quote. Along with that price quote, you'll be able to select the fact that you're a golf cart dealer. And of course, the files that are typically selected are files like Yamaha, uh, Nivelle, Red Hawk, Club Car, Cub Cadet, um, you know, some of these others, Easy Go, tech, which now we have a Textron off-road file for. Um, and any other price files that you might need, you can actually load into Commander uh, we're using a desktop app. We actually load them for you initially, so when we launch you, they'll be preloaded. But we deliver updates through this app. So anytime there's an update for Nivelle or Red Hawk or EasyGo or whoever it might be, you'll get an email notification from us stating that there's a new price file available. You simply click on that particular supplier that you're looking to load, and it'll check our server for an update, grab that file and move it onto your computer. So there's no actual work for you to do in the price file loading. All the files, if we look at a live view of the software here, are going to load into a uh, folder listing like this. And of course, you're not going to have as many files as that I have here. I've got literally millions of part numbers loaded into my data set because I have a lot of different distributors and OEMs loaded in. But here I'm clicked, for example, on the EasyGo file. If we wanted to navigate to uh, a different file, let's say, for example, Nivelle, we would just click on the Nivelle folder, or if we wanted to go to Red Hawk, we'd click on Red Hawk. And so the navigation style is very, very simple. You're simply clicking on um, the folder that you're looking to navigate to, and that lets you get to those particular parts and prices. Now, what I did with EasyGo is I also started creating something called subcategories. You'll see next to the folder, there's a plus sign like this. And if you choose to, you can isolate, just by doing a description search, you can isolate the product into their product type. So if I want all the batteries in a folder, um, I'd have a, a category for those items too, like all the batteries all isolated together, or I'd have cables together, or I'd have fasteners, for example. And so these are just some different ways that you can group the product together if you choose to. Otherwise, it can all just reside in that one folder up there at the top. So that's how the parts and prices land in the system. When we uh, go to add inventory to Commander, you're going to see that we already have the part number, we already have the description, the cost, and the list price. So really all that's missing is how many you have in stock. So you'll go ahead and key in or scan in a part number. I'll go ahead and just copy and paste it up here into the top into the look for bar or search for and that item comes up. So this is how it looks when you've never had it in inventory before. You simply add your stock, hit the save button, and that takes care of putting it into stock. This record, of course, will update when we load a new price file. Um, all the prices will update electronically. Your sell price you can customize. So if you guys don't sell at the same price that they suggest you sell for, um, you can customize your selling price. You can put formulas into the program to create a custom selling price. And there's also nine other price points that you can calculate. So if you like to have different price points for different customers, maybe cost plus a percentage, retail less a percentage, whatever that might be, um, you simply go into the back. It's really, really simple. You just open up the folder, 
go into the back of the file, and behind each price book is something we call batch rules. These are rules that execute every time a new price file loads, and you can put little Excel formulas in here that cause it to calculate these different price points. And we, we help you set those up if it's something you need uh, when you first start using the software. In here, we can also print a barcode label. If we right click on the item and we ask to print a barcode label, the system is going to generate a label. And I'll kind of chat about that for here, here for just a second. Because we're a Windows based product, obviously we're going to run off, not necessarily a full blown Windows server, but if you have a server, we'll definitely use it. But we can also use a, any sort of Windows, pardon me, any sort of Windows desktop as a server. So if you're running two, three, four stations, the only time I recommend a full-blown Windows server if you're going to go over 10 users. Jennifer, I don't remember. Do you guys have a server, or what are you guys running on? No, we do not. Yeah, and how many workstations? Work. You do, Kirk? Uh, we do not. We do, well, we do and we don't. You know, yes. It, it, Depends on the we have a server, but then, but then we also use it as you know, as, as its own, it's its own computer. Oh, as a standalone. So yeah, it's probably just a desktop or a high-powered desktop that you're yeah. using. So in either case, yeah, in either case, that will work. You don't, like I said, you don't have to invest, you know, three, four thousand dollars in a full-blown Windows Server. Commander, ninety, ninety percent or more of our customers are running on just regular desktops that are networked together. So this would be a typical configuration. Jennifer, how many computers were you looking to run on total? Four. Okay, and Kirk, yours just depends on the location, I assume, right? You have multiple yeah. locations. Um, yeah, we're going to start out with one location, and it has five, and then the other one only has two. So five and two, depending on the two locations that we that we do. Okay. Yes. And Jennifer, I didn't introduce Kirk. They he he's the dad. The dad. Correct me if I'm wrong. And he has a couple of sons in the industry, and they have multiple locations in Arizona and Palm Desert and. Um, uh, called Desert Golf Cars, if I remember correctly. Is that right, Kirk? That's right. And, and you nice. folks are a – sorry, go ahead, Jay. It's nice. I was telling him it's nice to meet him. Yeah, she said nice to meet you, Kirk. Nice to meet you, you bet. It's not every day we connect uh, Alabama together with Arizona and California all on the same call, so it's kind of fun to do these, these meetings sometimes. <laughs> Now, Jen, you guys are dealers for, you said Yamaha, right? Yes, sir. And Kirk, are you guys Yamaha or EasyGo? Or what are you dealers for? Probably almost everything, huh? We are a distributor in Arizona. And then we have a dealership in in Palm Desert. And is it both Yamaha? Yes. Okay. So that's actually, you guys are a pretty good match. Um, so moving forward. Um, let's talk about barcoding just a little bit here. We, we, we like to use scanners, especially for Yamaha parts. Yamaha part numbers are just simply awful to type in. They've got you know, very, very long part numbers, that 3-5-2-2 number. So if you're going to use a computer system and you can get away with using a scanner rather than typing in the part numbers, that's the way to go because every single Yamaha part will come up. Yamaha does not have UPC codes on their product. They use their part number as their scan tag because it's unique and it's a very long number. And so it lends itself very nicely to scanning. Um, Kirk, I am going to, for just a moment, um, mute your audio. And the reason I'm doing it is that when you have your computer speakers turned on, it loops back around through your microphone. So if you speak to me, I won't hear you for just a second, but I will pause for, for questions on a regular basis. And Trish, I'll do the same thing. Uh, I'll do the same thing with you folks. Um, and I think that'll clean up the audio just a little bit because I was getting a little bit of a looping effect on the audio track here. When we look at scanners, the, the current scanner that we're using is actually a Honeywell 1902. So if you're taking notes, this is a pretty good scanner. Um, and I'll show you a couple of work, uses for this. I typed it in wrong, but it still came up, so it's just forgiving. <clears throat> That's funny, that one came up for $8,000. I think somebody did a typo there. <laughs> That happens when you get internet resellers. 
Okay, the, the scanners list for, you know, six, seven, eight hundred dollars. They look like this. Um, and they're in a charging station, but we, we have them for under 300. They're wireless scanners that sit in a charging dock like this, so when you go to use them, um, they're always ready to go. So this is a great uh, scanner to use for selling parts. And of course, um, you can also, a feature that we've developed in Commander is the ability to take a physical inventory. So you can walk around the store with that scanner, scan the parts, and then bring the file that collects on the scanner to the software and it'll basically import right into the system. And we do that for taking a physical. So when you're inventorying items, um, it drops them into our physical inventory count sheets. So our physical inventory count sheets, this is the way which we traditionally did a physical inventory where we'd take an inventory and create count sheets based on a sequence that you would select, either bin location or part number sequence, and then create the count sheets. Um, and traditionally, you would see count sheets that looked uh, maybe something like this. Yeah, but when you actually use the scanner, the counts are already populated in the count sheet. Now, when we do a physical inventory and it's all said and done, then you apply it from this grid. Um, you have also a report. I like this report that generates at the end here. This is a plus and minus report, adjustments report. And what we're going to do is we're going to show you how accurate your physical inventory was. When we take inventory, it's going to show us that we had a $122 item. There were seven on the shelf. We took inventory and counted. There were only six. So that's a negative one adjustment. It's $122 negative. So that line item drops from $859 down to $737. This is letting us know how accurate our inventory was. If there were any shrinkage problems or whatever the case might be, um, the inventory is gonna gonna catch that for you, but that's another use for the scanner. So it's something to consider. I, I would definitely recommend getting a barcode scanner, at least one or two scanners, um, especially since we have the wireless refurbs for for just under three hundred dollars. This is the barcode printer that we use. So to print those labels that I was showing you just a minute ago, when you add an item to inventory in Commander, you just right mouse click and print a label. You kind of see a Yamaha label here at the top. And you can see because it's a longer part number, you'll notice how much longer the scan tag is even. <clears throat> you can put the price on the product. If you choose to, that's optional. You don't have to price it. Obviously, if you price it and you load a new price book and the price changes, then you'd have to relabel it. But this is printer specific. So if you do want to label product, this, this label printer is used for printing a parts label. Uh, we print a customer address label with it if you want to do mailers. Um, we also print uh, a unit serial tag. You know, there's different there's different uses for it all through the program, so it's a pretty good thing to pick up. Um, these are, these are refurbished printers at this price typically, but 250 bucks gets you a pretty decent thermal label printer, and you can print labels for for your items that don't have have labels on them. Now, obviously, the product that already has a label on it, all the product that comes from Yamaha and other companies that already have a barcode on it. You don't need to print a label for those. You're simply going to use the scanner and scan those onto uh, your invoices. Yep. Now, I'm going to go ahead and show one other feature here in the items section. And down at the bottom, you'll see a detail tab down here. And on the detail tab, what we're going to do is take a look behind that tab. And what you're going to see is a place where you can set something called min maxes. Now, this is just to keep fast moving parts on the stock, on the shelf, excuse me. So if I set this at, at two as a minimum, and I say four is my maximum, I'm actually instructing this item uh, in a way that if it falls, if the stocking level falls below two, it's going to attempt to order back to four. So for example, if we were to go and sell one of these, let's take this part number to an invoice, and there's our point of sale module. Now this is how we sell parts across the counter. So there's a point of sale level cash register on the left. To get it started, we right mouse click and start a new invoice. We can ask our sales folks to enter their ID so that we know who sold it. And of course, now we can go ahead and scan in the item. In this case, there's two suppliers with the same part number. The shorter the part numbers are, the more, more likely it is that you might have more than one supplier with that item number. So there I'm, I'm picking the easy go parts in this particular case. I have the option to go straight to the checkout window and print the invoice. That's the fastest way to do it, in which case it just uses a generic counter sale customer 
and the invoice process takes about five to seven seconds and I'm printing a ticket. So it's really, really fast. Um, if we want to add a customer to it, of course, we've got a new button here where we can go ahead and put a customer's name and address and build our customer file. Um, and because we're linked to QuickBooks, this, this customer that we add here is also going to be added to QuickBooks. So there's no duplicate entry of the customer information. I'm going to go ahead and do a search. And of course, here I could search for a customer by their first name or their last name or whatever the case might be. So if I did a search for Kovac and we add her, now we're selling to a specific customer. We go to the checkout window. Next, let's ignore this number up here, but it is interesting to note that Commander shows you the outstanding balance in QuickBooks. So if this customer had bought a couple of carts or whatever, and we were still waiting for payment from the financing company, whatever the case might be, I'd be able to see their balance uh, because it's, it's synced together with QuickBooks so we know their outstanding balance in QuickBooks. And I'll talk to you a little bit later in the demo about what we do and what QuickBooks does and how they work together, and I'll show that in the demo here today. Right now, the customer owes us 658, and our payment methods, of course, are listed up here on the left. So depending on how they're going to tender their payment, let's say they were paying cash and gave us $20, we could go ahead and add that payment, and then it works as a point of sale system where it's calculating the change, and we could print the invoice. So that would be one method of doing it. Um, another method would be to put it on their account if they were somebody that had terms with us, in which case it would create an invoice with the balance due and it would push that invoice into QuickBooks and it would land in my accounts receivable in QuickBooks. Um, I also have the option to run it through my merchant services account and I'll turn that on in just a minute and I'll demonstrate it in a different ticket. But we have integrated merchant processing in Commander 2. But for this one, let's just do $20 cash at the payment and we'll invoice it going to prompt us to return the, the customer's change, 1342, and then it's going to print the invoice. Um, now, the ticket that prints, this is point of sale. Now, we're not doing service. This is just selling a part across the counter. It's going to print your logo at the top, uh, so you can load a JPEG file into the program, and it'll print your artwork at the top of the uh, invoice. This is actually an uh, Articat dealer, I believe, that we sold a little while back. And it's going to show you the change and show you the customer and so forth. So that's one method of selling the item. Um, another method, of course, would be to use a small footprint printer. We have a star printer that we use, and this is a thermal printer. The only advantage really to this is we don't have to buy toner cartridge, which at $64 per cartridge is a huge advantage. Um, and we would print these thermal, thermal kind of grocery store style receipts and tie that together with our cash drawer. Uh, and of course, the cash drawer would kick open at the point of sale. We could collect our cash and put it in the drawer and so forth. Um, obviously, when we go to the service department, we're not going to use those small footprint tickets. We're going to do a full size uh, work order. And so that's uh, where we're going to go next. Uh, in just a second here, we'll go to the service module and we'll uh, create a work order. But I do want to pause for just a second because I had you folks muted and just unmute you here. Um, so, Kirk, Jen, if you want to ask questions, with any questions on the point of sale stuff as far as what you're seeing so far, selling parts, it's all pretty straightforward. Yeah, this is this is uh, yeah way more than what we have now. We have a, a fairly manual system. Okay. Are you handwriting the tickets, or or how do you do the point of sale stuff? Yeah, we're we're handwriting we're we're handwriting everything. Okay. So. The obvious work, Kirk, that, that, that creates on the back end, of course, for the folks that have to compile the numbers for the P&L and for the uh, sales tax reports and so forth, there's a lot of manual work that has to go in and taking those tickets to compile numbers that you need. And we're going to be eliminating all of that work on the back end simply by creating an electronic ticket on the front end. So we're going to be able to see at the end of the day how much money we took in, run a report, um, and I'll just do it. We're a little out of order here, but you know, for example, at the end, Commander's got tons of reports in it, of course. But one of them would be to balance your drawer at the end of the day, and I'll run it for a larger time period just so I get some numbers on it. 
but it'll give you a cash cash count page, and then it's going to tell you how much you took in cash and check and credit card business and so forth. And so, it's doing a reconciliation for you of your, uh, you know, your transactions for the day, and um, a number of other reports too that we'll touch on when we uh, when we uh, get a little further in the demo. One of them, of course, is that we would be interested in knowing is the valuation of our inventory. So if we look at the inventory and we look at the cost, remember QuickBooks is not going to keep itemized inventory. Commander is going to do that for you. So when we click into our inventory cost report and we ask it to tell us what we have on the shelf that has a, val a, a count greater than zero, this means we want at least one on the shelf. <clears throat> this is going to give us by supplier how many pieces we have on the shelf. In this case, I've got 109 pieces for a supplier called All Island, and its valuation is $17,000 just for that one particular supplier. So as you move through the report, of course, it's going to total up various suppliers for you and give you your valuation based on various suppliers. Here's our EasyGo parts, and of course, we have $2,999 in EasyGo. My total data set, actually, I've got a very large inventory here. Here's all my Yamaha parts at the end. I've got $929,000 in this data set just on the shelf. So it's a, it's a huge data set. This report was actually 248 pages. We use something called crystal reports, which means the reports generate very, very quickly, and they all display to the screen. So I didn't have to print the 248 pages. I can PDF it. I can save it. I can email it. I can do whatever I want to the reports, which is really nice. They also all export out into Excel if you like to manipulate data in Excel. So that's our inventory cost report in Commander. Um, of course, we sold the item. So if we go back to the item and take a look at it, we're going to see that the stock for that item has actually dropped now down to, to one. And so we had two, and we started, and it's dropped down to one. We record the sales history down here at the bottom. There's a tab where you'll see sales history. And so we're able to actually view the sales history for an item anytime we want to see how many we've sold, how many have we sold this year. Simply hit that view button. It shows us that we sold one to DKovac. And it shows us how much money we made on it. So accumulatively, as we sell things, we're going to have a sales history that accumulates here behind this item. And we'll be able to tell over a period of time how much money we're making on it. Now, because we had a min-max set, um, our min-max was set at two and four. And now we only have one in stock, so we're below our minimum. If we were to run a stock order today to see what we were supposed to be uh, ordering, it would pick up the fact that we needed to get three of that particular item. And we could send it to our ordering pad. The commander has something called a purchase order pad or a PO pad. So there you see the item showing up right there on the PO pad. So it's letting us know you should order three. Um, of course, we could check the sales history real quickly to see if we really wanted to order three. And when we check the sales history and we see that we've only sold one all year, maybe we would make a decision we really don't want uh, four on the shelf because we'll, we still have one. Um, you know, maybe we would change our min maxes here or change our order quantity and make an adjustment to it before we submitted the stock order. So we've given you the ability here to make uh, intelligent ordering decisions based on the sales history of, of the item. So you can decide whether you want that item on the shelf. Okay, we're going to go to the service module next. And of course, I'm assuming you both do quite a bit of service work. Kirk, you guys are involved in service, and we'll go to sales after that. I know you sell carts too, right? Yes. Jennifer, are you still with me? I am. OK. So on the left-hand side, you're going to see an icon that has a little yellow hard hat. It says repair order. And I'm going to go ahead and click on that. And of course, this will put us in a grid in which we can see all of the different work orders that we're doing for different customers and different products that we might work on. So we, we might not be limited to just working on golf carts. I mean, obviously, if you work on other other products, Commander Handles, we're, we're in a lot of different industries. We're cross-industry between power sports, 
golf cart, marine, and outdoor power equipment because those four industries seem to go hand in hand. We could search up the service history on a golf cart here if we were interested in seeing the sales history on a particular, uh, or at least service history on a particular cart, all we'd have to do is enter the serial number and it would pull the entire service history for that golf cart. So Commander is going to store service history for you going back as far as the, the date that you first start using the system. In this case, I've got data in here all the way from 2012. I've got five years worth of sales of uh, service history in this grid here. I'm going to right mouse click and start a new work order. And that's going to put us in our service screen where we start a new service ticket. Now, typically, you're going to start out by searching for your customer. In this particular case, I'm going to look for Mr. King. And his name comes up here, Spencer King. And we'll go ahead and we'll select him. He's actually one of our customers. So that's somebody that I believe is using Commander Ozark Golf Cars. Over on the right-hand side, you're going to see a spot where you can search for the customer's golf carts that he might own um, or search through the entire database if you want to. But this will give you an idea of the golf carts that that customer owns. So if they have a fleet, you're going to see their entire fleet here. This guy's got two Easy Goes and he's got a Yamaha here. So let's go ahead and add the Yamaha to the work order now. This, this information that we store on the golf cart is, is detailed. So it's not just like generic programs like Sage, Peachtree, QuickBooks, whatever, that, do, that does not have a place to create a record like this that's associated with the customer record. So our customer record has these golf carts attached to the customer record. And of course, they can have one or multiple carts, as I showed you there. This customer had three golf carts attached to their customer record. Um, we may have sold them to them. We might not have sold them to them. This one, we did not sell them as it's a customer cart. If we had sold it to them, the flag would be sitting on sold here. And we'd have additional detail about the sale on the back screen. But in the service environment, we can also load pictures, which is kind of a nice feature if you like to document things with images. So maybe it's a custom build you're doing for somebody, or maybe it's just damage to the golf cart and you want to document it with images. This is a great way to kind of have these images attached to the work order so that you can actually see. Uh, and of course, it's not just one picture. You can load a, you know, a whole gallery of pictures. You could put three, four, five pictures in here. It doesn't really matter. So that's a good way to document something when you when you start the work order. Um, in the top left is a green tab that says service request. And this is where we can type in what the customer says they need done. So maybe they need a new windshield. And we need to replace the battery. You know, whatever it might be. So this gets our work order started. Now, in a drop environment, of course, you could also require a customer signature on the work order. You can print it, they can sign it, and uh, that would be an additional you know, option for you simply by printing the work order. Everything we do in Commander starts out in quote mode or estimate mode. So we can put parts and labor on here all day long without affecting our inventory levels. Uh, but as soon as we know that we got the job, then we have a second status called posted, which is kind of a work order that's in process. Now, I want to pause for just a second, and, and I think I've pointed this out to you folks before, but if you're using a system like QuickBooks for repair orders or, or generic retail-type systems, they work on an in, on an in-out basis. So the item is either on the shelf or it's sold. When you invoice it, it comes out of stock. When it's on the shelf, it's just sitting there. And so that's problematic because in the service industry, we're taking things off the shelf we're installing them on jobs that we have in process. So we need the inventory to be relieved, but we haven't yet invoiced them. And Commander does that. It has this middle status called posted, which is going to allow you to, to do that. So initially, as we build the estimate, however, uh, we're able to put parts and labor on here and not really worry a whole lot about it. Now, as a dealer for Yamaha, Yamaha has an EPC. Um, electronic parts cataloging system through their dealer portal. I'm going to just kind of look up 
a generic third party one here that I do think I have some Yamaha product in. But these these products are all this is a power sports one that just happens to have some Yamaha golf carts in the uh, in the data set. You can use, of course, your dealer portal to do this and whatever the product is that you're navigating to. If you're interested in this one, I've got a free link that I can give you actually to give you access to this one. But the idea behind this is, you know, just getting to the actual images like this. And so you can actually then see the part numbers that you're looking for. So as you're looking at, um, you know, various sections of the, is the starter or maybe the battery charger. And we can zoom in on these images like this. So let's say it was actually the battery charger that we needed here. We tie in with this one where you just kind of double click on it like this and it looks in Commander to tell you if you have it. And in this case, I don't have it linked to my, to my Yamaha product. Um, so it's not going to transfer over. But the idea behind this product is it moves the parts electronically from here onto my Commander work order. Um, I could pause for a second actually and see if I could uh, get it to to interface. I don't have it. I don't have my interface set up. Let me just navigate out here and do a little bit of tech support on myself here. Shouldn't take all but a second. I just want to see if I can get the. Since we're using Yamaha and we're using golf carts, it might be nice to to get that piece just kind of communicating. Well, I do have a mapping here, and I have another one here. That's possibly the problem. I've got two of them. Let's eliminate this one down here for now. See if that helps. And apparently I eliminated the wrong one. I won't spend a great deal of time on it, guys. When you click on the item and it's integrated with Commander, you're going to see the part number come up with the description. It's going to tell you if you have it in stock. So it has a, um, it looks in your inventory to see if you have it. It shows you the price. And then the item will transfer automatically to uh, your Commander invoice. And so when we're looking at our Commander invoice, there's an import button at the top. And then the item, of course, will just drop right down into the body of the ticket like this, where it'll price and extend. Now that item apparently is not in our data set, so that might be the reason why it didn't come up. Let's go back and do that again. I'll have to double check why these items didn't come up. But all of this Yamaha product that we have, let's just try one other item, carburetor assembly. Is this a product that you guys would be interested? In? I know Yamaha. Yamaha has something similar to this, don't they, on their dealer portal, where you can look up the product like this? Yes. I have Jacob with me, and okay. actually, that don't use a lot. Yeah, he uses it a lot. Yeah, and we tie in with that one, Jennifer. So the same stuff I'm trying to show you here, <clears throat> we actually connect into that. And um, here you go. So I just I just randomly picked one item that didn't. Apparently wasn't in the data set, but here's a nozzle, for example. We can see the pricing. We can see we don't stock it. If we need it on the invoice, we just start creating a shopping cart, and we just tell the system, okay, we need that. Maybe we need the carburetor assembly. Um, you know, whatever whatever the products are that we need, we can add to like a little mini shopping cart. And uh, as you're adding these items like this, you'll have one, two, three items here, and you can just send them to the work order. So Yamaha's dealer portal has similar functionality like this, so that the part numbers just drop into our uh, service ticket like that. <clears throat> you see how they just pour it into the work order with the description and price. So that'll happen with Yamaha's dealer portal too. I guess they're using YDS or whatever it is that they're using. 
now we can put labor on here. We don't have any of these parts in stock, but we have the ability to add labor to our work order. And uh, you can build your own labor labor menu internally in Commander if you're interested in having different labor codes for you know replacing a battery or you know just your regular labor rate, ninety dollars an hour. I've got my shop rate set at here, and you can add that to the work order. So we can add parts, we can add labor, and we can do an estimate for this customer. Let's say we're estimating two hours of labor. We have we have our estimate built. We can see this would be two hundred and seventy dollars as as a job, um, and we can of course email that to them if we want to. There's an email button up here at the top. So if I hit that button, that's going to send them a copy of this estimate, and it's going to PDF it actually in the background, and it's going to send it right to them. So they get a copy of their estimate, and then they can uh, decide if they want to approve it or whatever the case might be. The customer gives us the approval, however, for the job. Uh, we'll open it up and we will go ahead and, and post it. That basically then lets us know that we have parts that need to be special ordered. If you look in the right-hand column, you'll see SO, 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 those three parts. Uh, it's letting us know need to be special ordered for this job. And it sends them to our ordering pad. So if we go back to our ordering pad and take a look, we're going to see those parts show up right there on our ordering pad. So it's letting us know we have these three Yamaha parts that need to be ordered. So if it was time, let's say for example, we had 20 parts on here and it's time to place an order with Yamaha, we would go to our purchase order module. We'd say, okay, time to create an order, right click new again. Let's look at what's on our PO pad and we'll take these three Yamaha parts, highlight them and drop them right onto the order. Notice no typing. I hope you're, you're, you're realizing here in all of this, I'm not typing in those part numbers. They transferred over from the EPC into the work order. Now they've transferred onto the purchase order. I haven't had to type them in once. I would choose Yamaha as my supplier, of course, if that's who I was going to be ordering from. And I would create my purchase order. Now, depending on the dollar minimum for each supplier, I don't know if Yamaha has, it appears that they have a $300 minimum before they pay the shipping. So if that were the case, Commander is going to count down and say, you'll get free shipping if you order an additional uh, $227. That's really helpful when you get really close to your dollar cutoff and you just want to add a few more items and then get free freight. So our purchase order here that we've created can actually be electronically sent to Yamaha once again. In other words, put into the Yamaha dealer shopping cart without you typing in the part numbers. You export it out and you tell it it's a, a Yamaha order. And this little feature right here will export the purchase order out into a file so that when you log into Yamaha's dealer ordering system, they will grab the commander purchase order and it'll populate your Yamaha shopping cart, if you wish, without you typing in any parts. So you understand that part, Kirk? Yep. Got it. Yeah, so that's a purchase order upload. So a lot of time saved in the process where the parts are moving through the system, and in fact, all the way to being sent to Yamaha on a purchase order without you having to uh, type in part numbers. At the very least, at the very most, I should say, you might have to scan an item onto a work order if it was something you were putting on a ticket. Because you have that option too. When, you, when you're building this work order, Let's receive these parts first, and then we'll go back to the work order. I'm going to receive the items in as if they just came in. So that's two clicks, and the items go right into stock. In a single click here, I can get my list up on the screen and see where the parts have got to go. So it's telling me the parts came in for Spencer King's work order, number 1215, and it's letting me know which job those parts have got to go to. So if I have a lot of different jobs on the go and parts come in, I might get something that looks like this, where it's showing me different parts that came in for different customers and where they all have to go. So I call this my parts distribution list, if you wish. They call it a special order call list, and this is also to contact the customers that uh, you've special ordered parts for so that you can let them know their parts have arrived. And that can also be done through email. There's an email notification button that we can send the invoices out to the customer through. Uh, but if we do go back to that work order, and the parts are here. 
<clears throat> we can actually get this job started. Now, the labor lines all start with an L on the left-hand side, can be assigned to technicians. So down here at the bottom, we have a technician. So this labor line here is actually associated with that tech right down there at the bottom. So Peter's getting credit for those two hours. Um, of course, I can click in the down drop, assign a different tech. Um, the technician can be scheduled. Now that we have the work here, we need him for two hours. And so if we hit the scheduler, it's going to put that appointment on the calendar for me. We have a calendar in Commander for keeping track of uh, technicians and their workflow and so forth. So if I have more than one tech, they all get their own color and they all show up on the calendar and you can track what jobs you have them scheduled to do and so forth. That's an additional feature uh, should you choose to use it. And we also have a feature for them to clock in and clock out on these work orders. So if they go to the time clock here, at the top of our work orders, there is a barcode that they can scan. It's another use for the for the uh, work order or for the scanner. So if they scan in that work order number 1215, um, it'll come up with just that particular work order. And they can then simply click on it and clock in. Now, that starts a timer running for Peter. So we can keep track of how long he actually took on that job, and he can clock out when he's finished, or maybe clock out when he goes to lunch, clock in, clock out. That's going to write a time value to the work order. The time value is written to the work order down here at the bottom in what we call actual hours. So we have a relationship now that develops between what we call billable hours and actual hours. And that's what we use to compute the technician's efficiency rating. So if we want to keep track of our techs and how many hours they're billing and how many hours they're actually taking, we have a way to do that. And our technician recap report will actually show you those numbers and uh, will actually calculate their efficiency rating for you. Now, we do have a way in Commander to add multiple jobs to a work order and group them together. And I'll just show you a work order that I did this with previously from a different date rather than add additional items. Let's go to the checkout window. We're owed $270 here. <clears throat> and we'll go ahead and we'll just take a check from the customer. Let's say the check number was 3456. Go ahead and add that payment and we'll go ahead and invoice it out. So this is what closes out our work order, if you wish, and prints the final copy of our work order. Now, this particular work order I have printing, I specifically picked one that did not show the part numbers. So we have different options. There are some people that don't like showing customers the part number because they don't want them to be, to give an estimate and have them shopping you. So we've got all these different templates that do different things, and simply by changing the work order template, you can change what it looks like. So here's one, for example, that's actually printing the item numbers on the ticket. And these are all different work order templates that have been requested by customers over time. And so you can see the way the work order turns out, the final copy of the work order, and there's about 15 or 20 different templates to choose from. Shop fees, of course, will be added to the work order if you set your system up to charge for shop fees. I've got mine set up to charge 3% of the labor amount. So the bigger the job, the more I want to collect in shop fees for disposable materials or whatever. Um, so I don't forget. I won't forget. And maybe you have an inspection fee that you charge when you take the job in. So there's different ways of adding miscellaneous charges to a work order um, if your industry uh, permits that. And then we get our final work order printing. Now, in order to get a copy of this into QuickBooks, and this is where, Kirk, you, this is going to be for you and for anybody that actually is using or doing any sort of intensive manual posting into any sort of accounting system. What we do in Commander here is we have work order number 1215 up there in the top right corner, 1215. So when we open up our QuickBooks and we decide it's time to push this information into QuickBooks, let me just close this. 
and launch it. This is what the mapping utility looks like that we've developed that ties Commander and QuickBooks together. So we ask it to transfer today's business. And it does that for us. So it's done. So this work order that we generated here, 1215, should now also be in QuickBooks. So let's go and have a look for Spencer King over in QuickBooks. There we go. Go to our customer center. And we'll sort by last name here. And we'll find Spencer King. Now, over in QuickBooks, if you look carefully over here on the right, you're going to see RO, repair order, 1215. And there's the payment that came with it. So it's already in QuickBooks because we ran our transfer. And if I click on that work order and open it up, we're going to see that we have a copy of that work order sitting right there in QuickBooks for us. It's already there. So it's in our accounting system. And instead of making just single journal entries, you know, with totals on them, we actually bring the entire ticket across with the customer detail, the payment, and then we put the part number and the description of the item together in the description field because we don't want to add individual items to QuickBooks because we'd have no way to update them. Um, the other limitation of QuickBooks that people don't realize exists is that QuickBooks has an item limit. QuickBooks Pro and Premier both have an item limit of 14,500 items. So if I look that up in Google here, you'll see it'll come up, 14,500. Item limit in QuickBooks. So what that means is that as soon as we've added 14,500 items to QuickBooks, QuickBooks is going to crash and we're going to be forced to upgrade our QuickBooks to QuickBooks Enterprise, which is around $3,500. So <clears throat> by using this method that we use where we actually just add the item and the description together in the description field, notice how the Yamaha part number is sitting right here, and then the description of the item is sitting right here, but the whole thing is in the description field. We're not cluttering up the QuickBooks items list, but we're still getting all the detail that we need to do our accounting. So that's a very clever way of still being able to use QuickBooks Pro, which is only $200 a year, and uh, integrate it with Commander. So I'm gonna open up the uh, audio here for a second. Any any uh, comments or questions on that, Kirk or Jen, Jennifer? No. Hi, sir. I, okay. I, have, I have a question. So, so so you're you're getting around the fourteen five fourteen thousand five hundred. Which I'm sure Yamaha has more than that. By 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 what method? I mean, I sort of I sort of. So let I'm me sort of let me explain that. the Yamaha the Yamaha price file, which might have, uh, in our case, if you added Nivell, Red Hawk, Yamaha, EasyGo, whatever, you'd have hundreds of thousands of part numbers. Gotcha. And we keep those part numbers on the commander side. We don't keep them on the QuickBooks side at all. That's that's all I need to know. So yeah, but when so we I don't run have the to worry about I don't have to worry about QuickBooks then. So we don't have QuickBooks now, so it's this is going to yeah, be yeah. You don't have to worry about it. The only thing that we use in QuickBooks for, and why I, I bring it up repetitively during the demo, is QuickBooks is still used to do your accounts receivable if you have to collect payments from customers it's used to do your accounts payable um, it's great for doing your banking and making your bank deposits and uh, doing your final p l and balance sheet so if those are things that um, you know you have an accountant doing a different way then you don't have to worry about it you can just use commander but if you are managing a significant accounts receivable You've got bills that need to be paid when you buy a product, you know, pay your mortgage, pay your phone bill, whatever. Um, QuickBooks ties nicely together with your bank account for that type of function, for those types of functions too. Oh, so what you're saying is you don't, you don't need QuickBooks to run this program? You do not need QuickBooks to do all the things that I'm showing you on the commander side. Okay. Um, 
but we use QuickBooks for paying bills, for example. We don't pay. We don't do bill pay in Commander. Okay. We're not tied together with your bank accounts in Commander. QuickBooks would. Does that make sense? QuickBooks is an accounting system, whereas Commander is going to be more of a point of sale, work orders, purchase orders, golf cart sales, golf cart tracking, things like that. We do all the things that QuickBooks cannot do, and we allow them just to do the back end accounting piece. And the two work hand in hand because this mapping utility that I'm showing you here actually transfers the financial data into your accounting system. And that's something you folks are doing manually. So, so Kirk, where, where do your numbers go? You're handwriting the tickets. Where, where, where do the accountants put everything? Well, we can, we, we have you know, accounts receivable, accounts payable, and uh, a semi, a semi, you know, perpetual inventory. But most of it is handwritten. So, you know, all this stuff that you're showing me is, 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 you know, so far ahead of what we're doing now. And that's why I finally talked my boys into getting into the, uh, the, the 21st century, the 20th century. Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's exciting. It gives you a lot of controls that you, you, that you don't have. I mean, I can give you in a second or two the valuation of the inventory on the shelf, whereas they would have to take a physical inventory to actually get that number. And we could do the same thing for the golf cart in, in inventory. And those are high dollar items, you know, that you want to keep your finger on, especially if you have flooring involved. So we'll come across to Commander again. We're on the Commander side here. And I want to go across to this little red and blue key that you see up here in the top left-hand corner. And I'm going to click on that. And this is a spot where, of course, all the golf cart industry, uh, inventory resides. Now, these could be customer carts. They could be carts that you stock. They could be, uh, and you can separate them using this, these folders on the left-hand side if you choose to do that. Uh, we separate them through a status, which simply says this is a customer's cart, this is one you sold, or this is a stocked cart. And we have a filter up here where you can select which ones you want to view at any given time. So it doesn't matter that they're all in one grid. If I want to just see my stocked carts, I click on stocked, and it filters out all the customer carts. Even though some of these have a customer name, these are probably units that were trade-ins. And so I still have a customer's name or possibly on hold because we have a deal in process with them where they're in the process of purchasing those carts. But if I have a, I have a straight uh, stocked cart, it's going to appear like this. So here's a golf cart, for example, that we have in stock. So this would be one that would be available for us to sell. Now, when we sell them, we go to the invoicing module and we simply take the serial number with us. And of course, we, we do print a, bar, a serialized unit tag. So we can print a unit tag for tagging the units with the serial number on it. And I know a lot of them already have a serial number on it. So you can capture the serial number right here with a scanner as you're entering the golf cart inventory. Uh, and then go to your uh, sales module in Commander and sell the cart. So it's as simple as just scanning the serial number uh, that particular golf cart goes right onto the ticket, and we can add uh, any additional items we want to add. If we were selling it to a specific customer, which would be the case, we would choose the customer's name. Let's say we were selling here to Ginger Rennick. She's non-taxable. Let's just go ahead and make a regular taxable customer. She's a cost plus 10% customer. It brought that discount with us, but let's go back to just making her a regular retail customer. And our pricing, of course, depends. Um, here we're going to sell it at retail, $9,500. And we can work the deal up. Now, I don't know how many of you do financing when you get involved with the financing for the carts, but there is an additional sales calculation piece up here. And this is going to take the numbers from this deal and actually push them into a financial calculator, which is going to compute a payment if this customer was doing some type of financing. So in this particular case, it's showing him that his payment would be 
$304 if they financed it over 36 months at 5.99%. Now, if the customer said, well, I really was hoping for a lower payment, instead of playing with the, the sale price, maybe I can bump the term up to 48 months, and now I've dropped the payment to 234. And let's say they were looking for a payment of $200, and I said, okay, well, let's see if we can get you a $200 payment and do a rollback against the down payment. So now I can tell him if he gave me $1,478 as a down payment, and we did this deal over 48 months, I could get him that $200 payment. So it's a, it's a live kind of working sales calculator that's tied together with the invoicing module as you're building your deal so that you can compute financing and, and then uh, tell the customer those terms depending on if there's a financing company involved. So any, any questions on this piece here? Uh, we do none of that. Okay. So we'll go ahead and save the numbers and we'll exit out. Jennifer, you're okay on this piece? We are, we're good, thanks. Okay, so we'll exit out of here. Now, when we go to conclude the sale, remember this was a stocked cart, we're selling it to Ginger Rennick, we go to the checkout window, and let's say it was $9,975 and um, the finance company paid it. Maybe we want to put it on account. We're going to wait for the finance. So let's go open account and we'll go ahead and generate a ticket with a balance due on it. So this would be something that we're just going to put on account. And you'll see that when it prints the invoice, it's, it's going to have the serial number on it. It's going to have the year, make, model, and all the details on that unit, how many hours, the color, and so forth. So it's got everything you need on the invoice basically to to generate the uh, actual golf cart sale. And that cart is immediately now tagged. It is no longer available. It's no longer a, um, let's go back and get the sale number to the one we just sold. You're going to see here in the golf cart module, if we look this up by the actual sale number, You're going to see what happened here automatically. Just because we did that invoice, we didn't have to do anything else. We, we just generated the invoice. And what it did is it moved it from a stocked unit. Now it shows it's a sold unit. It collected the customer's name here for us automatically so we know who we sold it to. And if we look on the back screen, we're going to see that we have an actual date sold, 11:29. so we know the date that we sold it. Um, if there was any financing involved, if there was some flooring involved, for example, with that, and we had had a flooring amount over time that we had entered here of maybe $45 on that particular unit, um, it would have incremented our sale price by $45 so that it also includes the flooring amount. So you'll see anytime we add flooring, that's added here to the cost of the unit. Any kind of repairs that you do on it, if for example, you had taken this in as a trade-in, or I know you folks are doing those custom builds where you're you know, buying the, the chassis and then building it up, uh, we can generate a repair order to do that and all the parts and labor that go into building up that cart would work where you would have a base cost of whatever you paid for the golf cart initially, and then you would have a dollar value that would populate right here in the internal repair orders field showing you the parts on labor that went into building up that cart. So you would know the total value of the cart based on uh, the parts on labor that you put into it. And that would be a great feature for you guys that are building up those custom carts. So now we've sold the golf cart. If Ginger Rennick were to walk into our service department, uh, you know, 10 minutes later, and we go to start a work order and we search for Ginger Rennick. And we take a look at the golf carts that she owns. We're going to see that golf cart right there that we just sold her. There's the easy go. So it, it automatically maintains this relationship for you where the service department will have you know immediate access and know that that was one you sold her on November 29th, 
And you can hide the cost, of course, they don't have to see that. But they can immediately select it to a work order and get a work order started here. Um, you know, so it's all interactive. All those numbers are moving through the system and posting so you can see exactly what happened. <clears throat> so just to kind of wrap up the demo, guys, we're right at the end here now. We showed you the, the barcode printer, of course, the thermal printer, the cash drawer, the work order, the QuickBooks interface, pushing information across from Commander into QuickBooks. This is the merchant services integration piece if you want to run credit cards through Commander. We've got a feature that we can turn on in the preferences of the program where we say, okay, we're going to use an integrated processor. Ours is done through XCharge. And that activates a feature so that when I uh, go to sell items or when I'm doing a transaction, let's just take this part number, for example, take it to an invoice, and let's say we're selling a part. <clears throat> so this is our point of sale module again. We go to the checkout window, and the customer wants to pay us with, I actually have to log out and log back in in order to do this. Let me do that, because it actually launches as I launch Commander. And I just want to show you that integration real quickly so you can bookmark that there is also this optional merchant integration. Every user logs in with a username and password, so you can control who can do what and who can go where in the system. I'm going to very, very quickly do a new invoice for you guys. We're almost done here. And we'll go ahead and sell that item. And of course, when I go to the checkout window here, I could choose my merchant option and run it through the system directly as a credit card payment. So I'll activate that. And there is a video I can send you where you can see that too. Data conversion, this is just if you're switching systems. If you're coming off a different dealer management system, and, and um, Kirk, you guys are not. I mean, you're not using any system, so this doesn't apply to you. You, you don't have any customer lists or inventory or serialized golf cart list to send us. But Trisha or Jen, if you guys have something um, that you want to send us, we can import this into Commander. And that's a big, big, big time saver when you first get started because we can get your customers and your inventory and your serialized units into Commander electronically so you don't have to manually enter them. The pricing for Commander is, is slightly less than QuickBooks Enterprise. Our pricing starts at $2,400 for one computer. It goes to $2,900 for two. And then it goes up $250 per seat after that. So if you were three computers, you'd be $3,150, four would be $3,400, and so forth. Uh, the maintenance starts at $100 a month for one computer, goes up slightly to $120 for two, $130 for three. Um, but there's a whole lot included in the maintenance, and I'll let you know what you get in return because it's a, it, there's a huge value to it. Um, the monthly maintenance that you pay includes all of your price updates. So you'll get your updates for Yamaha, Nivelle, Red Hawk, EasyGo, Textron, whoever. Um, we put them in there for you, and then we host them on our server here so you can load your updates. So we will continue, and we've been doing this for 38 years. So we've got around 3,000 installs now in 10 different countries. So we're a very, very established company, and we support pricing for probably four to 600 different companies at any given time. So um, price updates you'll be able to load. We're not going to bill you for those. So you need a new Yamaha file, and those are going to be available either monthly or every other month. You'll be able to load a new Yamaha file. And so those are included in the maintenance renewal that you're paying. Um, the second thing that's included is all your technical support and training. So when you first sign up, Kirk, you don't have to worry about it. We're going to connect in. We're going to install it. We're going to train you. We've got all that worked out to where we, we know how to get people up and running on our software and what they need in order to learn it. Um, if you hire a new parts manager a year from now, they can attend training, and there's no charge for that. It's all online, and it's. I'll touch on that here in just in the next slide. The other thing that's included in the maintenance fee are all the software updates. And so as we develop new features and we expand the product and we improve it, we're not going to come back and sell you um, you know, some sort of additional feature or whatever that we develop. We actually include the updates. So with QuickBooks, for example, we have to come back and buy it every year and update it and so forth. With Commander, we'll automatically update you. We don't have a contract. 
in terms of a minimum term. We don't lock you in for five years or whatever the case might be. Um, we simply believe that if we take good care of you, you will remain as a customer. And we've got customers that have been with us going on 30 years. Um, so, you know, we've got some really long existing relationships. System options, if you need a barcode printer or scanner or any of this additional equipment, um, that's not included in the software price. But as you can see, you can either buy those from us or you can purchase them yourself. Um, it's, it's fine either way. Um, the software is typically delivered through a download. So if you place your order for Commander today, uh, we would send you an email and you could immediately start downloading the software and we would schedule your installation for you. So it all happens fairly quickly. If you guys are planning on getting up and running on it on Commander in the new year, we can certainly accomplish that. Uh, we'd want to get that started fairly soon so we could get it installed and get you trained and load your price files and, and give you some training. The training is actually hosted every Wednesday, so we have a weekly webinar every Wednesday. Uh, there's a training webinar for about two hours where you sit and you just kind of go through how to do an invoice, how to do a work order, how to do a purchase order, how to add inventory. We've got some one-on-one -on -one training that we'll do with you, which means you just spend time with one person rather than in a group. But typically, we like people to do the weekly webinar, the group webinar first, and then we do the one-on-one -on -one training after that. There's some training videos that we have hosted on our website. Um, and on YouTube, and of course there's an online help menu, like an electronic manual that loads onto the desktop. So we've got a lot of different tools for training. Um, our tech support's available six days a week, California time, so Pacific Standard Time. We've got techs that are here as early as 6 a.m. Um, every day except Sundays, so we're closed on Sundays. And um, that kind of brings us to the end of, you know, the formal portion of the presentation, so. I'll open it up for questions. Okay, I, I have some questions. Each each store each store would if we have we have a we have a, 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 a satellite location a small satellite location, so we would have the same we would have the same uh, each store would be in itself. I mean, a, a separate a separate fillings and so forth. Can you? I mean, as far as Commander goes, Kirk, when we do a multi-store deal, we always like to give discounted pricing, but we don't run everybody off the same copy of Commander unless you don't mind everybody's numbers being commingled. It'll look like if you want them to be separate businesses with separate numbers and be able to tell, you know, which store was doing which numbers, we would install a separate instance of Commander at each location, but we would certainly consider the the fact that you are placing an order for multiple stores and there's a multi-store discount involved for that. Each store does pay its own maintenance, but the maintenance is very nominal. And the maintenance is, well, but but uh, we would bring the, the main store out first and then and then and then the other store in Arizona would be would be a, a separate in the future. Yeah, and you could run it, I mean, in theory, you could run it as a satellite off the other one, but the only thing I don't like about that is if, you know, when they when you do invoice number 100 and they do the next invoice, they do invoice number 101. And there are some ways to separate out the totals, but you run into all kinds of little quirky issues when you go to extract your numbers and you want to know what the satellite store is generating on its own. So I prefer to do them as what I would call separate instances of the software because it gives you much better financial control over what's happening at each location. Okay, we have two service trucks out in the field. Uh, would we consider those just a just a um, how how do how do you how do you account for those? So the service techs that are out in the field, if they're going to connect to Commander and you want them connecting. Um, they would need Windows-based laptops or tablets, and, uh, you know, we would make sure that they had a license on those devices, that those devices were licensed. Uh, and, of course, we would work that into your deal. I, I usually don't like to charge for the tablet licenses. So if there's, you know, if you're doing five users at the location and you need two additional licenses for the tablets, we would probably work those into the deal for you, too. Okay. Number three is QuickBooks. What what is there? Just one QuickBooks? I, I mean, you know, you know, I go to the internet and 
there's all sorts because we, we we use Sage. So so if we have QuickBooks, do we QuickBooks? We'll show you the version right here in the middle. You're going to see um, it's going to be QuickBooks Pro. We support an integration with QuickBooks Pro, uh, with QuickBooks Premier, which is kind of the middle one, and then there's Enterprise. Now, Enterprise is more expensive than Commander, so we're not doing that one. If you were going out and buying QuickBooks today, you'd be looking for the desktop version of QuickBooks Pro. Okay. And it's around $200. Okay. And, and since we have, since we have uh, Microsoft, it, it, it'll network just like it does now, correct? Yeah, you would need you would definitely need the Windows version and not the Mac version. Um, and if you wanted multiple users to connect to the QuickBooks, that's something for you to decide at that location how many people need access to QuickBooks. Keeping in mind that the majority of the functions that are going to be done day to day are going to be done in Commander. You know, QuickBooks Pro it comes with a maximum of three uh, user licenses. So you can put it on up to three of those five workstations. At one time? Or just the workstations itself? All oh, three people could connect at the same time if you had a three user license of QuickBooks Pro. So if we have if we have five computers, we can only run three at a time, correct? You could only run three on QuickBooks. Commander, you would run on all five. Commander, you could run on 20. It doesn't really matter. But the QuickBooks itself, look, most folks, when they're using QuickBooks, their parts manager, their service manager, their technicians, they don't need access to QuickBooks. There's nothing in QuickBooks that they need. The only people that need access to QuickBooks is the bookkeeper and maybe the business owners and management. So of those five computers, you would pick the three computers that were being used by uh, the, the, the business manager and the bookkeeper, and that's what would get the QuickBooks loaded onto it, not any of the other. You don't need QuickBooks on the, uh, on the parts department's computer or the service department's computer. You wouldn't need it there at all. All we need is the, the, the three, and that would, that would give us the, the, in the office, there's just two at the counter, three in the office. So we could, all we need to buy is the three, the, the, the three uh, uh, QuickBooks Pro, three user, and that would be fine, right? But that's correct. You'd buy the three user license of QuickBooks Pro and a five user license of Commander. Okay, gotcha. Okay, Jennifer? Um, I just had a couple of questions. I wanted to clarify the pricing. Um, if we have four computers that we'll be using, the initial charge is 3400 Is that right? Um, for four computers, let's go back to the pricing page. So we would be, yeah, if we were looking at it with this pricing model, it's 2900 for two plus another 500 for the two other seats. So yeah, you'd be an initial price of 3400 for four computers for your setup and your maintenance because it would be four computers the maintenance starts at one at a hundred for one computer uh it goes up slightly it goes 120 for when you're running two computers 130 when you're running three and it's 140 140 per month if you're running four computers that's it and that right, includes no, just... sorry go ahead yeah and that includes all of those services that we were talking about so um, yeah, your maintenance is slightly higher only because they they expect you to have more employees calling and needing help and needing support if you have four computers versus the person that has one. Right. So you would be thirty yeah, you'd be thirty four hundred and one forty a month. Um, explain and, to me the seventy five for the QuickBook interface. Is that a one time charge? And what does No, that you're gonna get that you're gonna get that for free. I didn't mention that we actually have a promotion going at the moment on this QuickBooks interface. Instead of paying 475 for it, um, that's going to be included in the 3400. And is there any additional fee each month for that? Um, to no, there is not. Okay, so it's the flat 140 includes everything. Yeah, the flat 140. And actually, the way the price quotes work right now, let me pull up a price quote for you, and it'll make more sense. And we can do this together because you guys are very similar. 
Kirk needs five computers, you need four. So here's the 2,900 for the two. And then Jen, you would go to two more users. So that adds the 500. There's the 475 for the QuickBooks interface, but then we back it out at the bottom. So you end up back down at 3,400. Your maintenance would be the 140 a month. And it would actually okay. start. It would actually start in January. Actually, I could probably at this stage because we're coming up on the end of the month. I could sneak it and kick it all the way back to February. Okay. So that's it. You pay your initial, and then you pay your monthly, and there's no other charges involved. It includes as many price books. Like I said, if you need any of these other price books that you see listed here that we have, you're welcome to have those too. I just typically so select the most common ones for golf cart. Um, and that would be it. I mean, it's very, very simple. I'll throw in the Yamaha. This is supposed to be a $300 charge, but I'm going to throw in this Yamaha EPC. And that's that thing that I was showing you that, oops, let's get my caps lock turned around here. Um, And that's the one when you're using the Yamaha portal and you're, and you're looking up the parts, the images like this, will transport the parts onto the commander invoices from, uh, from their EPC. So that's something you're going to want. It usually has a one-time charge of $300 to set it up on all five computers. But I'll just put included. And I'll do the same thing for you, Kirk. So the only difference between the price quote here for you, Jen, is that Kirk's going to be one additional user. So Kirk, yours would be uh, three additional seats. But then keep in mind, if you're going to have that other location, we can also discuss like, how we're going to discount that and what we're going to do for you there, OK? Now, do you have to pay for updates? Or will it always remain that 140 per month? No, so that that 140 per month covers. So we have we have a pretty decent staff here. We've got about 25 people on staff, and some of them are involved in making price updates, Jen. So those every time there's a Yamaha update, we don't get it in a format that's usable in the software. We get it in a funky format. And we've got to extract the data and make a file for you, and we've got to do it for Nivell and Red Hawk and EasyGo and so forth. So there's one department that makes price files for you and, and hosts them on a server. And so they're taking care of making sure the price updates are available. So that's included in your maintenance. We've got another department that are tech support guys that are sitting in little cubicles answering tech calls and doing training and so forth. And they're available to you to answer questions. And then we've got programmers on staff, which are very expensive, of course, but full-time programmers on staff that are writing code and continuing to support and develop the product. So that maintenance fee that you pay covers all three of those different uh, expenses, if you wish, in terms of department expenses and gives you access to those resources so that the software is fully supported. It stays at that renewal rate. In fact, we haven't had an increase in our renewal rate uh, for like 12 years. Oh, wow. So, okay. Yeah, so we're not, this isn't a bait and switch. Let's get them. And everybody says, well, how can you guys afford to do it for so little when all your competitors are charging $800 a month or 1000 a month? And, you know, I don't like to do this in front of people, but I'll do it. We had 3,000 accounts, and everybody was giving us $125 a month. You know, it generates pretty good revenue just in terms of supporting the infrastructure that we have as a company. So that's just from renewal revenue. And then, of course, we have the revenue that comes from new sales, which is also significant every month. So, you know, we've got it figured out, I think. We've been in business 38 years. We're not concerned about other people telling us our software should cost more and we're not charging enough for our maintenance. I mean, the dealers don't tell us that. They're happy with the price. It's usually our competitors that are complaining, you know? I hear you. Yeah, they tell us we've destroyed the industry by underpricing our product. You know, that's what we're told. So Now, Tricia, you have a question. I guess there was an, a question earlier about an employee time clock. Um, that question that you typed in, there is an employee time clock just for technicians to clock in and out of jobs. 
which I showed during the demo, I do not have an employee time clock for clocking into the eight, you know, an eight to five kind of time clock. Um, keep in mind that QuickBooks would be doing your payroll, not Commander. But what we'd, we would do in Commander is we would give you the ability to run a report and say, well, let's take a look at our technicians. Let's see what hours they've billed and let's just do a year to date so we get some numbers. And just like this, we're going to get a report that says, okay, these are the technicians and the hours that they've billed and the actual hours that they've spent on the job on the job, and so forth. And so we can get our efficiency rating. Let's say I was looking for just Peter and I wanted to have a meeting with him this morning about his annual review. And I say, okay, Pete, let's see how you've been doing. And I pull it up and I say, well, you've given us 144 billable hours and you only took 119 hours to do the work. So you're a pretty good tech. Your efficiency rating is 120.86, which is actually not really realistic. In the real world, you're lucky if you can get an 80% efficiency rating. But uh, it's computing the comparison between that, that 144 and that 119 to calculate the efficiency rating. And then, of course, on the detail tab, it's going to show um, all of the clock in, clock out detail uh, for every job that they completed and how the time accumulated. So we do have that as a time clock, uh, Tricia. We do not have an eight to five time clock for clocking how long they were actually uh, at, at your place of business. We're not monitoring that. So that would have to be done on a separate uh, time clock if that's something you have your employees clocking in and out for the day. <clears throat> So that's kind of where that puts us. Trisha, how many computers are you looking at running? And, and sorry if you don't mind, just type in the name of your your the, the business that you're uh, that you logged in from because you logged in and it just says you, uh, this has your name. It doesn't have the actual. Business name. Okay, so that kind of brings us to the end, guys. It's, um, I'm going to be sending each of you a price quote. Um, really appreciate your time. Thanks for logging in today. And um, I will, I will certainly get, make sure. How do we get recording of this? I'll, I'll go ahead and stop the recording at this point. Uh, Kirk, let me do that. And I will send you a copy of it. I'll compile it. Okay. And I'll send you a link that you can click on and uh, download. And then that way you'll have... Uh, a way to get a, uh, a copy of the recording. So that's a good question. If you folks want a copy of it, I can send it to you also, Jen, if you want. And, okay, thank you. Uh, you that's welcome. fine. Uh, th thank you, Steve. It's been great. Uh, we're going to do it. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll get on it as soon as you get the price back to us again and uh, uh, we get QuickBooks ordered because uh, we want to do end of year inventory. Hopefully, we can do that by. Uh, on this system. It, you know, yeah, I'm really started. excited about working with you guys because I know that you've got a good reputation and your name out there with the multiple locations and I think that uh, you're, you're, you're in strike range for us with your with your California location certainly. Yes. And uh, Arizona not too far away so very very excited to have the opportunity to work with all of you. So appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Thank you, Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.